Um, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this current affairs lecture by Radboud Reflects, the Faculty of Philosophy, Theology, and Religious Studies, and Fox. This is the third, now already fourth, uh, current affairs lecture that we're having on the war in Ukraine, and today we're zooming in on the religious side of the conflict. So um, we'll be zooming in on the role religious leaders play within the conflict and what uh, maybe mitigating role they can play. And we'll be doing so with Alphonse Brunning. He's director of the uh, uh, Institute for Eastern Christian uh, uh, Studies, at Radboud, which is affiliated with Radboud University. And he is endowed professor at the Protestant Theological University uh, in Amsterdam. Uh, he will give a lecture of about approximately half an hour. And after that, there is questions from you for the audience. My name is Sia Tempels, I'm program manager at Radboud Reflects, and without further ado, I give the floor to Alphonse Bruning. Okay, uh, thank you, Sid, for the introduction, and thank you to you for coming. Uh, so, um, I have been announced as uh, going into the question of uh, religion in conflict, or is there a religious dimension to this conflict? It starts, I have to, okay, that's me, it starts... Uh, with a notion of a certain confusion as far as uh, we in background reports and um, in the media are often confronted with some kind of religiously charged terms um, that appear to play a role in this conflict, whereas um, we are usually um, uh, not quite able to put them into the right frame, and this is what I'm tr I will try to do uh, this afternoon. Um, so some of them, I just named them briefly, not very systematically, and you might be aware of others related to the same field. Um, we are uh, confronted with the story of Kiev being actually a kind of cradle of Russian Christianity. You see a picture of the Kievan case monastery uh, behind me, uh, which exists since, well, um, since the 10th century, maybe earlier, the, the actual roots of this monastery are longer. Um, Russian history, whatever Russian means in this context, can be traced back to the baptism of St. Vladimir, who in Ukrainian is pronounced as St. Volodymyr. Um, so this is where it departs from. It's the mother of Russian cities. Yeah, what would we do with that? Is it about holy Russia that actually needs to be defended, needs to be defend, needs to defend its canonical territory that would actually include Ukraine? Uh, is it about Christianity in Ukraine and some of those following the media a bit longer in, in, uh, in concerning Ukrainian affairs might, have, might be aware of conflicts that have been there earlier in connection with the granting of uh, autocephaly, whatever that is. Uh, to a branch of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church? Uh, is it a defense in a larger framework of Russian civilization in a position to or under threat from the West? Eastern versus Western Christianity, perhaps orthodoxy against Western Christianity with all implications. Uh, the other picture I um, reproduce here is a page from Samuel Huntington's book of uh, The Clash of Civilizations, and you see that there is a borderline running uh, between Eastern and Western Christianity. The West ends, among others, somewhere in Ukraine. Um, or is it a war of values, something like traditional Russian spirituality against Western secularity, democracy, spirit of freedom that would have set up to conquer, legitimately or not, Ukraine. You see, when just I name these terms, um, the confusion, confusion rather rises than, uh, than, than, it, um, than it, it becomes easier. Um, the first question then, which we, um, and I think this is where we have to start from, um, would we agree very simply to, um, to put a religious dimension or to endow a war with a religious dimension in the first place. Can that have any? And I think um, our state of affairs, and if we have followed the media as first, uh, that the war in Ukraine is by a majority of the international community just qualified as a violation of, between brackets, but this is important, secular international law. Territorial integrity, 
um, which is based on the principle of territorial, ter territorial uh, integrity of existing states, the inviolability of existing borders, including those of Ukraine. And it's, would, it would be easy to refer to other contracts in this contact uh, in this context, such, such as the final act of Helsinki Conference in 1975, uh, the Budapest Memorandum, all signed by either the Soviet Union or the Russian Federation. So um, it is by the international community, um, it has been just qualified as a violation of law, of secular law, and in this sense also as a crime. But what about this, then these ideas of Ukraine being kind of integral part or natural homeland of the Russian Federation. To this we received um, a day after Putin's notorious speech um, on Monday, uh, February 21st, a reaction which included the, uh, um, the acknowledgement of the Donbass um, republics. And here we have a reaction at the UN Security Council from no other than the UN ambassador of Kenya and I phrase him briefly, at independence. So he speaks about the colonial past of his country, and uh, as you might recall, also there, uh, the current states have been carved out rather arbitrarily. So at independence, had we chosen to pursue states on the basis of ethnic, racial, or religious homogeneity, uh, we would be still waging bloody wars these many decades later. And I skip part of it. However, Kenya rejects such, such a yawning from being pursued by force. We must complete our recovery from the embers of dead empires in a way that does not plunge us back into new forms of domination and oppression. We rejected irredentism, which is the theory that claims kind of uh, sacred countries and natural homelands for current territory and expansionism on any basis, including racial, ethnic, religious, or cultural factors. We reject it again today. So he made a great impression with this, um, with this speech, also because he somewhat debunks all kind of religiously or culturally endowed stories about claims on territory. Um, perhaps useful in the sense that Russia, traditional Tsarist Russia, also was an empire. So again, what kind of, okay, we have another voice. Oh, this is front and back side. We have another voice which, is, which will keep us busy for a while and which I quote here for the first time. Also about territorial integrity. But in, in this, this very secular term, um, but it is Metropolitan Anufri from the Ukrainian Orthodox Church from the Moscow Patriarchate, so he belongs uh, in what sense we will highlight later, also to the Church of Moscow. Um, defending the sovereignty and integrity of Ukraine, we appeal to the President of Russia and ask him to immediately stop this fratricidal war. The Ukrainian and Russian peoples came out of the Dnieper baptismal font, and the war between these people is a repetition of the sin of Cain, who killed his own brother out of envy. Such a war has no justification either from God nor from people. So again, in the phrasings of a churchman, we found the invocation of territorial, ter territorial integrity and also the rejection of any religious justification of the war. Many other Orthodox church leaders equally and more or less at the same time this is immediately have condemned the war, but the role of Anufri um, is peculiar in certain senses. For the time being, uh, we stand with the fact that he also, um, on the base of religion, uh, rejects any religious justification. So this is where we stand for the moment. We have international law, secular law, uh, which qualifies it as a crime. We have a churchman who even qualifies it as a sin. Can we give any religious meaning to a crime or a sin? Apparently not. Um, next to this, however, um, so at this point I could just say, okay, the story is finished and we can go home and I can leave you to, um, this is uh, lunch.
lunch collation, so I can leave you to your meal. Of course, it's not e as easy as that. So um, when we, or as I suggest here, when we could agree that it's very difficult to give a religious meaning to this warfare, um, then we at the same time have to realize, and that leads us back to the concepts initially mentioned, uh, that many others in one way or the other involved in the conflict um, would invoke such um, religiously charged terms. Um, and that forces us it, to get a better um, systematic view on how that is done and what of that might be in what sense ever legitimate or not. Uh, that forces us to tackle the question of, it's a bit of theory now, uh, religion and ideology. Um, one thing when I do this is important to be mentioned. We are used, when I, we speak about ideology, to consider this as something bad. You know, this is like um, ideology covers the same semantic field like um, as, as fanaticism, brainwashing, manipulation, propaganda, fake news, you name it. Um, and it is opposed to truth and objectivity, and it is also opposed in our context maybe to religion. Yeah? So this is a, a way of thinking we are used to, uh, but it's not the way I want to treat the term of ideology here. Um, in social sciences, and that also refers to peace studies and refers to um, studies on nationalism and so on, or on, on religious studies, um, we handle uh, the term ideology in a more functional way. Um, so functional mean they, they fulfill a function, neutral, um, in a way that, according to someone as sober as Nicholas Luhmann and the system theory, um, can even be exchanged. Yeah, so the, the main point is, well, there's, certainly I could talk the, uh, the remaining 20 minutes um, about religion and ideology, so I have to subsume, subsume this a bit here. Um, there is two things, I think, which are important. My colleague, Evert von der Zwerde, two weeks ago, also has addressed this, this topic and uh, mentioned some other protagonists. Um, first, we have... Ideology is a shared set of values and general assumptions of a collective, um, and that might concern things such as hierarchy, social order, virtues, uh, shared values, history, war and peace, and so on. And it not only um, circumscribes this shared set of values of the collective, but in some, some sense also it creates collectives. Um, if you recall that, um, say it, it would help. Say some, some, you, you feel connected with someone uh, you don't know personally. Yeah? Because I am a member of a party, um, of a political party, for example, I feel connected with other members of this party, even if I do not know them personally. So scientists speak of imagined communities in this sense. The term initially is applied to, uh, to nationalism. So if I am Polish, I feel connected with other Poles, wherever they are, although I don't know only very few of them personally. So this imagined community sense. Yeah? Um, and in this sense, we also have ideologies within religion. Uh, we must realize that religious tradition is usually, in a broader sense, not very homogeneous. That appears to, that applies for Christianity, for Islam, and so on. Yeah, so um, it might help again to realize how many different Bible interpretations we have come across, um, how controversial can be the interpretation of one particular sen sentence, and so on. Um, Within one religious tradition, therefore, there is space for a variety of different ideological concepts, again, in the neutral sense. That also pertains to questions of war and peace, more generally the admissibility of violence. So what we can say is that whereas no world religion would simply and directly sanction the arbitrary use of violence per se, most of them know a specter ranging from radical pacifism via just war theories up to even holy war ideas, the latter yet related to extreme context. So this is preserved in a sense to kind of apocalyptical scenarios. 
Uh, this, the same applies for uh, questions concerning national identity in space and time. Religions usually hold to universalist and egalitarian views. So Christianity is go and teach all people, that's Bible quotation, but might offer certain pan patterns to rely for, uh, to rely to for, um, to rely upon for holy places, chosen people, Israel in the Old Testament, for example, or sacred stories, some victorious um, battles sometimes. Um, well, okay, this is tricky, but uh, remember the. Um, the path of the people of Israel to the Red Sea, for example. Yeah, this is a sacred story. Um, so, and then, uh, is there a difference, for example, we have now ideologies, we have seen that there is the possibility of quite a variety of standpoints. Is that a, how do Eastern and Western Christians now refer um, to these Questions. I just get a little bit confused with my. Ah, there is. So, which ideologies are now at stake? Um, I initially confronted you with versions like Eastern versus Western Christianity, clash of civilizations, just war versus nationalism. Which kind of ideologies um, is it with what we deal with now? Uh, first frame often invoked is that one. East versus West. Here we see reappearing the uh, extract from, um, from Huntington's Clash of Civilizations. Has been very influential in the 1990s and early 2000s. Uh, the West ends, according to him, where the sphere of influence of Western, Latin, Catholic, Protestant Christianity ends and where it edges on either Orthodox Christianity or Islam. And you see this borderline, among others, runs to Belarus and Ukraine. Um, in pure academic circles, Huntington's scheme, after having been intensely discussed in the early 2000s, is long obsolete and hardly referred to as an adequate framework to understand current conflicts. Outside academia, however, it continues to be invoked for purposes of self-identification and geopolitical profiling. That is true to some extent for the Islamic Ummah, but also in various contexts and differentiated applications, for Orthodox Christianity, among others within the Russian Orthodox Church. So what is it, if we for a moment subscribe to this vision, what is the difference in, in terms of war and peace between Eastern and Western Christianity? Maybe um, Orthodox Christianity is more um, prone towards towards war is um, um, more nationalistic, as you often hear, so let's address stereotypes. First, the West, war and peace in Eastern Christianity, uh, the just war theory, um, I try to be brief here. Uh, 1992, Catechism of the Catholic Church, if a war can be qualified as a just war, it needs to fulfill certain conditions, um, so the, the just war theory is old in Western tradition, as you might know. Initial formulations go back as long as to St. Augustine in the 4th century, 5th century. Um, but it has experienced kind of rephrasing, reforming um, scholastic theology, the School of Salamanca in Spain, 16th century. Um, this is what we currently handle. Um, there is also serious criticism on this uh, theory. Um, defining the legitimate defense by military force, um, the damage must be really serious, inflicted by the aggressor. All other means of putting an end to it must have been um, exhausted. Uh, there must be serious prospects of success. The use of arms must not produce evils greater than evil to be eliminated. Well, you can think whether this is applicable to any modern conflict, and there has been critique upon this conflict, especially after World War I, when people said, well, this kind of industrial battlefields um, doesn't offer any space for this kind of allegedly um, uh, serious or earnest limitation of, of war. So Catholic theology currently uses the concept rather as a kind of proof concept. Yeah. If at all, uh, let's look to this concept and see whether there is, um, so whether 
to, it's it's a concept to control warfare rather maybe to to avoid it not not to legitimize it um, so then what about Eastern Christianity uh, the initial church fathers which are still uh, the main sort of the Greek church fathers uh, of uh, uh, of minor Asia, which are still the main reference point for Eastern Christianity, are, uh, I think there's no exaggeration to, to state that, are pacifist. Uh, so a soldier even um, had to abandon his profession when he wanted to be, become a Christian and, and be baptized. Later on, that was slightly revised. Um, Eastern Christianity doesn't even have a just war theory, um, but it always handled a basic conflict. So for, you, for me personally, let me phrase that somewhat uh, in, in improvised, improvised manners. For myself, I might choose the pacifist option and allow myself to be killed. But what about some others standing next to me, defenseless? Um, do I have the right to just abandon them and, and choose for my own pacifism? Um, or is that immoral? Yeah, you see the conflict. Yeah? So if it's my family, it's my children, it's my neighbors, friends, and so on. Um, so that could be immoral, and so at some point the church fathers also saw the necessity to, for, for certain concessions. A key text always quoted in this context is Canon 13 of St. Basil's Epistles. St. Basil the Great, one of the Cappadocian church fathers in the 5th century, if I'm not wrong. Um, and he says, our fathers did not reckon killings in war as murders, but granted pardon, it seems to me, to those fighting in defense of virtue and piety. So not in defense of uh, women and children, it's still the spiritual. Uh, in defense of virtue and piety, other translations offer uh, in defense of piety and sobriety. We will return to that. However, it is advisable that since their hands are not clean, they should abstain from communion alone for a period of three years. Um, whatever we make of it, it doesn't offer any possibility for heroism or for sanctification of war victory or something. Um, and we have stories from Byzantine history where actually church leaders have exactly rejected that. So soldiers returned from battlefield as, vict uh, as victorious and they claimed to be sanctified and the church said, okay, we won't. Yeah, this is still... Um, So let's briefly then, starting from these more general questions, uh, Russian and Ukrainian peculiarities. So we zoom a bit onto Ukrainian and Russian um, contexts. Uh, in the Russian context, two saints are usually uh, often referred to um, as spiritual examples, but also in the context of, of warfare. Boris and Gleb, uh, sons of St. Vladimir, whom we have already met as the one who has baptized his people on the Dnieper River in Kiev. Uh, they were martyred in 2015 in the context of a dynastic struggle. Um, and they were, con they were murdered because they refused to respond violently to violent attacks in order not to further escalate the conflict, in order to... Uh, paved the way for a better peaceful solution um, in imitation of Christ's example in order not to further escalate, as I said. Um, they are one example for so-called soldier saints, which we have all, all, all over in the Orthodox Church, and sometimes they are dressed even with armor and, and war clothing uh, on icons. But you should realize that they has, have never been um, canonized because of being victorious, because of being heroes in battle, but rather for virtual lifestyle, for being martyred. Um, so it's not that they, they win, won the battle, but that they died. You know? um, and this, this kind of, well, they can, they can just much more be considered pacifist saints because of, non -reje of rejecting violent response. Uh, then they can be classified as war heroes. Um, but of course there is another strain to the Russian tradition. I hope I make it with time. Um, the basis of a social concept of the Russian Orthodox Church published and conceived and then published in the 1990s, published 2000, 
In all times, Orthodoxy has had profound respect for soldiers who gave their lives to protect the life and security of their neighbors. The Holy Church has canonized many soldiers, taking into account their Christian virtues and applying to them Christ's world, world should be word. Um, Greater love has no man but this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Well, um, first is that, um, well, in what sense is the biblical quotation interpreted here? Um, if he has laid down the life for his friends, it's his compatriots. It's not. Uh, World War II is crucial in this approach, so it's patriotic. The interpretation is, and there we have the imagined communities. It's not my friends standing next to me, but it's the friends, those close to me, are my compatriots, are my Russian fellows. Um, so if you, you can call that ideological, but again, I insist on in the, in the neutral sense, in the sense of imagined communities. Uh, the impact of World War II on such, such interpretations is crucial. And there is a number of things to be mentioned. Um, the, the World War II in, in Soviet and also uh, Russian memory um, firms as the Great Patriotic War. This is what allows me to interpret this Bible phrase or to understand this Bible phrase in the sense of a patriotic community. Um, much earlier than Stalin himself, on the eve of the, the German invasion, it was the Russian Orthodox Church who mobilized people for defense, defense of the homeland. Uh, the defense was against fascists, not so much against Germans. So it was phrased in ideological terms more than in ethnic. But that explains the significance, this stereotype, sometimes a bit idiotic, but the stereotypes of the Ukrainian fascists has now. So uh, the, the Russian narrative very much relies on stereotypes types from, from World War II. Um, it's affected in reality, and there is the paradox. Um, German invasion was directed towards Belarus today uh, was directed towards Ukraine. Um, so it affected all parts of then the Soviet Union, including Ukraine. What you have today is a number of so-called hero cities who defended or suffered during the war. That is Leningrad, today is St. Petersburg. That is Volgograd, earlier Stalingrad. But it is also Kiev and Kharkiv. So um, this, this revocation of the World War II uh, narrative has its paradoxes, to put it very softly. Uh, what we see on the image here is, first, it's again um, a picture of the cave's monastery. You know it in the meantime, yes, baptism, St. Volodymyr. Uh, but what you see in the, the statue in the background has been erected in, in, in Soviet times. Uh, it has the Russian name of Rodina, which is Mother Homeland and stands for the defense of the Soviet then homeland against German invasion. But we are in Kiev, yeah? Um, World War II, next chapter. Uh, what we have here is the main cathedral of the Russian armed forces uh, erected in recent years and, and also um, inaugurated in 2020, on the day of 75 years commemoration of the end of World War II, the Great Patriotic War, devoted explicitly to the armed forces. Um, the Patriarch has um, been present during the inauguration. The initial idea came from the Ministry of Defense, uh, collected large amounts of money, and, um, well, I don't have the time, and maybe it's better not to further dwell on the uh, imaginary and the iconography here, but I'll leave it to the audience where there is the, uh, whether the actual difference between saint and heroism is, is, is preserved. I think the balance has obviously shifted. Yeah? So that. Uh, from here, we depart to Ukrainian realities. I have to be quick. Um, we currently have, so there is orthodoxy not only in Russia, the dominant religion, but also in Ukraine. In, in Ukraine, it's complicated, but uh, to put complicated things a bit easy, we have three Byzantine Rite, not outrightly orthodox, but Byzantine Rite churches. One is the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church, um, who... Uh, 
since the 16th century acknowledges, uh, recognizes the Pope as their head, so they have been influenced by Catholic theory uh, over the years, but celebrate liturgy according to Byzantine style. Um, the head is Major Archbishop of Kiev and Halic, residing, however, um, currently at least in Lviv in Western Ukraine. Uh, this is the man on the top, uh, Svetoslav Chivchuk. <clears throat> Then we have the Orthodox Church of Ukraine, which is, well, I put it very roughly, uh, the National Church of Ukraine emerged in 2018 after the unification of two independent from Moscow uh, national churches. Um, and uh, they had as metropolitan, uh, well, they have been acknowledged by the Patriarch of Constantinople under whose jurisdiction they currently um, they currently are. Metropolitan of Kiev, Epiphany II, um, is the head. And the Ukrainian Orthodox Church still as a subdivision, but largely autonomous. This is why they call themselves Ukrainian Orthodox Church, not Russian Orthodox Church in Ukraine. Uh, largely autonomous, but under the jurisdiction of the Patriarch of Moscow, Kirill, head Metropolitan Onufri, whom we have already met in two quotations. Well, next to this, um, suffice, suffice it here to mention that Ukraine is always a multi-religious country, been a multi-religious country. So we have large minorities of Jews, Protestants, Catholic, Roman Catholics, um, Muslims, and so on, united also in a common forum. Just a moment. Okay. How do these uh, Orthodox churches then relate to the current war? Well, I said the Greek Catholics are somewhat influenced by Roman Catholic scholastic theology, and uh, it's it's also for that reason that they uh, repeatedly invoke the just war th theory. Um, it is done by Shevchuk, by the Archbishop, and by some others. Um, the Orthodox Church of Ukraine issues more patriotic appeals, partly in defense of a Kievan Christianity model against Moscow invasion. And the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, which we already have met, condemns the war as fratricidal as the sin of kind, uh, kind against Abel. Um, that leaves us with the question... Um, what is Kievan Christianity? So we need a counter-narrative to the Russian world, if you want. And second, what is meant by fratricidal? Um, I try to sum it up as briefly. I see that um, I'm running out of time, but um, maybe I might be forgiven for rounding this up in a way because um, yeah, there is, the story wouldn't be complete. I try to be quick. Well, you might have heard uh, about Moscow, the third Rome. This is the, one of the elements in the, in the Russian narrative. What I can quickly say is that this concept hasn't played any role in uh, Russian history um, up to the Crimean War. And the Russian Orthodox Church hierarchs still today uh, very rarely refer to the concept. It doesn't play much role. It plays a role in more geopolitical concepts which originate in late 19th century. Um, but we have the counter-narrative of Kiev being the second Jerusalem. Uh, that means it is no Rome. There is no hierarchy. There is no, it's a sacred place where the gospel actually took place, the story gospel reported in the gospel. But um, it, it's not so much about bishop, about Rome's, about centers. Rome is also the city of the emperor. So it's non-political. And diversion often handled in Ukrainian uh, his national narratives is uh, it's kind of Christianity in the borderland. You know? It's um, non-political, non-hierarchical, open to both East and West, ecumenically minded, tolerant, with a stronger accent on theology, erudition, reading and learning, distinct from the more ascetic traditions in Russia. Given Christianity, the, the concept in some variations uh, is being referred to by both the Ukrainian <coughs> Greek Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church of Ukraine. We can do some, so it's... Just a moment. It's the two on the top, if you want, yeah? Um, 
Um, I think the holy Russia theory I will just uh, just skip here. Well, what, what has, um, I can summarize that briefly also because my, my colleague already has referred to it. Um, we have protagonists of this concept who are critical of, of the West yeah, as to being too individualistic towards too pluralist, which means controversy in place of unity, um, neglect of spirituality, um, a kind of intellectual pride uh, opposed to Russian um, simple piety and so on. Um, outstanding figures, outstanding personalities, such concepts are the two. Um, I repeat it here, Dostoevsky on the one hand, Alexander Solzhenitsyn would be another one. Um, I very much doubt, I can't, it should, should require literature studies, but I very much doubt that they would approve the war as it is now. Yeah. Um, Slavophile theories after 1991 have been uh, subsequently adopted in uh, several frameworks that also distance themselves in Russia from the West, kind of Russian civilization theory, which adapts also not uh, completely reproduces Huntington. Um, and another one under the title Russian World, uh, Ruski Mir is the, the title. It's a foundation, just a bit like German Goethe Institute, if you want, um, but with a different content, um, set up with active participation since then uh, with Patriarch Kirill. Um, many patterns, so we currently have a discussion whether this allegedly Russian world ideology is responsible for uh, giving the ideological underpinning of the war. I'm not so sure about that. There are elements in this theory and, uh, which can certainly be used for that, but um, in, at the stage still a couple of months ago, this concept is not so consistent as to be, um, to be directly held responsible. Yeah? Um, geographically pertains to roughly historical territory of Russian Empire in Belarus and Ukraine, also Belarus and Ukraine, but has more than merely geographical in, in, um, implications. Um, Orthodox Christianity is a cornerstone of the concept in whatever interpretation, and Kirill, on the other hand, initially made clear um, that he and the Russian Orthodox Church would understand the concept in a cultural, not in geopolitical sense, and that a revision of state borders was not intended. So, um, since especially 2015, even more, we find very rare mentions of the Russian world theory in uh, statements of the Orthodox Church. Um, but again, this includes, includes um, back to historical realities, that includes, um, say, Russians and Ukrainians as part of a common geopolitical or spiritual or cultural entity. Um, and this is what Onufri, is, who is recognizing um, Kirill as, as his head, is referring to. Yeah? Ukrainian and Russian peoples came out of the Dnepro baptismal font, the same. Um, Ukrainians and Russians, of course, in the imperial period have a common history, an entangled history. Not common in the sense of being identical, but entangled. To illustrate that, what I copied here is a kind of um, is, is the proportion of Russian uh, of Ukrainian language uh, population throughout the Russian Empire by 1897, and you see that okay, this the yellow areas, which is just the, the governments of the of the empire. Um, range out of the border of current-day Ukraine, but you have large minorities, Ukrainian minorities, all over, um, all over the country. Not by chance, by the way, also in the, in the areas of, of remote Siberia, uh, because they were deported. Yeah? Um, so there was also, it, it was not just um, a kind of natural uh, mixture, but um, there were stories behind that, also because of um, striving for Ukrainian independence. is entangled, and uh, it's, it's important to say it's entangled, but not identical. Um, we have lots of, uh, we have lots of, um, of, of examples of Ukrainian originating people, churchmen, um, poets, who played a role later in Russian history, in Russian literature, 
Uh, Nikolai Gogol is someone perhaps best known to you who was born under the Ukrainian name uh, Mikola Hohol in the, in, the, in the outskirts of Poltava. Yeah? So his native might be as much Russian and Ukrainian. And this holds true for many people in Ukraine. Yeah, so 75% um, of current day population in Ukraine are completely bilingual. You can experience this on, on the street. Um, if you ask, ask people, approach them in, uh, in Ukrainian, they might, or, well, for me personally, I have sometimes my Russian is a bit better than my Ukrainian, and sometimes I just uh, approach them in, in, in Russian, um, and they don't have any problems with that, but sometimes they would prefer to say with Ukrainians, it's also okay. Um, the problem is that, well, they have the choice. You know, in a, some, some have migrated to Moscow and built up a career, and they, now they speak predominantly Russian, but not because they had to learn it, but because they had to make a choice. And you have numerous biographies in church contexts and in cultural contexts, so there is in a sense, but Ukrainians usually never cease to be Ukrainian. It's not that they give up their identity, but to say, what makes us Ukrainian is to have a choice, not so much to speak Ukrainian, but in terms, in place of Russian. Yeah. Um, that also applies to religious terms. Up to 20, uh, 2021, in religious service, uh, we found like 40% members uh, of one Orthodox jurisdiction which would not identify themselves clearly with one jurisdiction, um, <clears throat> but just as being just orthodox. So it's a matter of choice. So if, if I have an interim balance, and I'm about to finish, what do we have? We have in Eastern and Western Christianity, rather pacifist religious traditions with some concessions to warfare, if inevitable. We have ideologies which are not necessarily exclusive or aggressive, although they can made, be, be made. Uh, that was the state of the art some five months ago, say. What has gone wrong? Where, where does this monstrous war come from? And here we have... Um, we have the opportunity to go into some statements, not from uh, recent days or months, but from earlier. For example, uh, Putin's spirituality. Boris and Gleb are saints, that's clear, but they gave up without a fight. That cannot serve as an example for us. They lay down and waited to be killed. So, um, sorry, Mr. Putin, this is not canonical. Yeah? So this is um, just deviating from parts of, of uh, also Russian Orthodox spirituality. I introduced, consciously introduced Boris and Glad to cultivate. Um, it, it brings us closer to the iconography we see in the, uh, in the military chapel I presented to you earlier. Um, Patriarch Kirill very reluctantly re, uh, re, um, reacted on the outbreak of war and finally went over to justify it as a kind of defense of Russian traditional spirituality um, against Western secular lifestyle. Um, he uses the gay pride parade sometimes as a litmus test. Um, uh, it's, it's difficult to, to digest these sermons, and um, I'm still, I must say, um, I still can't find any of the traditional Western spirituality back in this. Yeah? Um, so, yeah, okay, um, that has led to conflicts also within uh, the Russian Orthodox Church. So, summary. Um, you see, what, there, there is more going, um, dying in this, in this war. Not, well, at first stance, it's just people. You know, and when we return to news, it's um, all our considerations about historical narratives and religious concepts might turn obsolete because it's as basic as, yeah, well, return to Mariupol. Um, but um, apparently it's, it's like um, even those concepts who might uh, have deferred earlier on um, are now 
in a way obsolete. Yeah? So someone like Onufri, who I introduced, he might have held to, with some reason, to kind of entangled history of Russians, Ukrainians, but try to tell that now, uh, those who are suffering from uh, bomb shelling. Yeah? So it's, it's really it, many integrative histories which had a chance to reconcile are now just dying. And that's next to the, uh, the very physical way of death. Uh, it's one of the tragedies of this war. Um, well, I think I leave it here. I had another story which can maybe reappear in, uh, in the discussion, but I already um, extended my time. Um, I can't leave you with an optimistic outlook, I must say, but it, it hope, I hope I might clear what, what religion can play and what it does play and where it is also part of, kind of victim of what is happening. Thank you. So thank you for being here, but of course, Alphonse, thank you for your, for your lecture. So thank you very much, and I'll see you next thank time. Thank you for your patience. <laughs>